this is a, a, a discussion on uh, OpenUC 4.6 uh, architecture and direction. And uh, we have uh, uh, Douglas Hubler, 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 how, however I want to say it, um, and, uh, and Cyprian Hackman. Uh, they are uh, part of our load testing and build team. Um, we have our uh, SIP core team here, uh, Jogi and Daniel. And uh, we're, uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, architecture pieces, uh, also some of the new things that we're doing. Um, so we'll give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, we're going to talk about our testing procedures. Uh, we're going to talk about our new test automation. Uh, we'll talk about a status of 4.6. And we're going to talk about some of our roadmap items, OK, near-term and long-term uh, roadmap items. And uh, I'm going to lead it right in and, and let Douglas take it away. Go through this real quick because I'm sure you've seen this all before. But uh, here I'm just trying to illustrate um, uh, and uh, the the architecture of the system. Each one of these boxes represents a running uh, running service. Um, this is. Um, um, Part of our uh, unique to our system are, uh, is that each of these systems, each of these servers, uh, we think of this as a cluster now. We don't think of it as server-centric, hardware-centric. But we think of the, this is how you want your cluster, and as you want uh, redundant services, um, you just add things to the, to the cluster. So. Douglas is Windows challenged. <laughs> He's a Linux user. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is our old architecture uh, in 4.4. And what I want to point out here is um, kind of the architecture we had here, where we had a, a, a database that stored a lot of the data. Check, check. All right. yeah. So this, uh, each server had its own database dedicated to, to hold uh, phone registrations, phone subscriptions. And as that data accumulated on this server, um, uh, it, uh, asynchronously, the data would replicate back and forth. So anything that happened here, went here, anything that happened here, here. And on other servers, there was a kind of a, a algorithm to try to, to, to essentially replicate all the data throughout the system, uh, end to end. Find the audio, video guys. So go find these. And then that's for the telephony data, the configuration data, state of Postgres. And as you change things in the configuration system, you first write it out to Postgres, and then it would go to each of these databases and say, um, "Here's your new users." If you add a new user to the system it would push that out to all those databases. Uh, an odd path here is if you change your pin within the system, you're, you're obviously interacting with the uh, IBR system. The IBR system says, actually makes a SOAP request back to the config server. It says this user changed their pin. That would go into Postgres, and that would get replicated out into the databases. <laughs> That's why I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and also, there's a lot of, a lot of paths going on. That's what we had. Now, what you see here is it's, it's server-centric. This server has to do everything it can. It can't be tied to any other parts of the system to do its job. So here in 4.6,
So 4.6, we, brought, we, we introduced a, a NoSQL database called Mongo. And what was attractive to Mongo was that its API for saving data was very similar to the one we were using. Sorry. The, very one, the same API that we were using, Mongo was extremely fast, it was open source, and we instantly loved it from a developer's point of view on what it had, um, and, and we were very easily able to port this to the Mongo database. Now, Mongo database is what's called single master. And that means um, there's only one server within the cluster that uh, takes the rights. All the other servers in, this, in the system are slaves, and they pull the reads. If that master goes down, other nodes will take over. That's all built in. So even though it sounds like there's a critical point of failure, it's actually just simplifying the system, a single master. Uh, so you don't have a critical point of failure, it's just a different architecture. You'll find that a lot of these databases are one or the other. They're either multi-master or they're single master. Mongo database is in the camp of single master. So, so if a, a server goes down, there's no, there's, well there's a problem, but there's no real problem in the system. That server is uh, out of commission. DNS SRV will get all your traffic over the server and until that server comes back, you're fine. One of the problems that you have is if that server's still up, accepting traffic, accepting zip traffic, but it can't write to the database. Um, that's a bad situation. Because it's actually responding back to the client, yes, I took your registration, but in actuality, um, it, you know, if it, it had trouble, um, it's going to it's essentially lie to you. So what we're doing now is we're saying, if I can't write to the database, I actually send back a SIP message, 500 SIP message, 500 meaning I, you know, there was a problem. I can't take your SIP message. And built into the SIP protocol is this retransmission. Since if, you, if I didn't receive a response from you, or if I receive an error response from you, I'm gonna try again. And when DNS RSRB comes back to here, this server has no problem connecting Mongo, and it's able to uh, take your registration, complete your call. So, still on that, could you explain the purpose of both cluster on that box on that other? So conversely, in this one, if these didn't replicate and, and, and that failed, your opportunity to tell the server there was some problem had, had been lost. And so in this situation, when that happened in 4.4, uh, the response from the customer was that if you had a two-node system, half my calls are failing. Not like some, or it was exactly half, because half the registration is here, half of them here, because DNS SRV was split. If you had three servers, then it was a, a, third, uh, a third of your calls completed. So with this new architecture, every call completes. This one's having health problems. This one will take all the traffic. All the rights go to the right place. And now we have 100% just leveraging the simple. So if the single master dies, yep. is the term nested equivalent to the master or is it? Yes. Elected? It's, elect, it's elected. Uh, who, has the short, who has the most fresh data? You can even wait it if you want to. And Mongo takes, you know, we study Mongo, what it does, we tested it, uh, but Mongo takes care of all that for us. Okay. So you kind of, if you want, if you had a cluster in multiple locations, say, don't elect another master, it's the same thing, so it gives you less power, instead, for it is Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, we really love Mongo. We're still using Postgres for a lot of the configuration stuff. Um, and this text is wrong, that's just an artifact. Uh, we're still using Mon uh, Postgres for all the uh, configuration stuff, uh, but we are in, pl in plans to move everything over to Mongo. Configuration, uh, configuration stuff is not in the critical path. You don't need uh, HA uh, for, for Postgres. Uh, so CDR is on same Postgres? 
They're they're in post grads right now. Um, they're gonna work with Mongo then. I don't see any reason why not. This, it would be perfect for Mongo. It does it deals with Mong humongous data. That's actually how it got its name. <laughs> and and that's what's that port will happen? When would the port happen? Yeah. From post grads. Um, I don't think we can confirm that yet. No. Okay. Or, and what he does, what kind of thing we have, do we have a lot more to put the records up in the database? Um, I would say you would have, you'd learn uh, Mongo. Okay. So yeah. the in-house people that have really Mongo, people stuff, right. stuff, and then having seen all these customers with CDR, every requirement is different, so they usually want to step after our database anyway. They usually want to massage it. Um, there is. Uh, yeah, so there's soap. Um, well, the CDRs pull from here. Why would you use a database for us to get API? Um, you're right. If, if what you want is available in the API, it's like what what are the active calls or the calls within this range? Um, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. No, there. You know, it's well. I mean, it's a SOAP API, so it's all you know. Could you please explain what would be how those arbitrary words for one database? Yep. Um, it's. Uh, all it is is it looks, uh, most of the system, it looks like another copy of the database. It acts like another copy of another slave. It just doesn't keep the data. Uh, so, so an arbiter just, um, so okay, so an arbiter is, uh, if you have a Mongo server, uh, it all votes for who the next master is. So if one, one Mongo dies, the other one, they all vote between them, who's the next master? So you can get into a stalemate. So if you have two servers, uh, if you have just one server left, it doesn't know if the other one died, so it doesn't take over. So you need an arbiter to say, I can get to the arbiter, the arbiter can get to me, neither one of us can get to the other master. So between us, we can decide one of us will be master. The arbiter says, I don't accept data, I'm lightweight. So you be a master, then that's how that does it. So an arbiter is just like, if you have it, uh, an even number of databases at an arbiter so that you always have an odd number. database left would not take over because it doesn't know that it's not it might have been it might think it's on a network partition it may think that uh, just because I can't connect to them I don't know if they're running so uh, we are exploring opportunities uh, with having a, some kind of trigger to say um, if you can if you know if you can uh, think of a system within a customer installation that says there's no question this server's left I know for a fact because it can ping the gateway um, execute this command, and that will take over as master until they restore. But that goes outside Mongo. We're, we're actually doing that because we need that. I'm going to pass the mic here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what is the difference between Mongo and Mongo? Um, Mongo is actually like a Linux distro. It's not like it's a Linux distro. I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, so Douglas is actually doing a lot of work around that uh, right now and trying to get away from the need to have an arbiter uh, or, you know, an odd number. So, yeah, the, there's a match if you have a two-server system. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting situation that we're trying to solve. Yeah. yeah, because in the past we've been able, able to have two servers, right? So. So now, if you if somebody has a two-server system and now they want to 
do HA with floor six. Now, okay, right now you have to have a three server system uh, to have that uh, collection capability, have the arbiter. Okay, so, so we are doing work around trying to get back to being able to just have a two node system. Yes. No, it's for if you have four servers, you need a fifth. So. So, so you'll see something in 4.6 now. We have the ability to specify that right in the GUI yeah. as to where the database master is now with the, with the latest update. So, um, so, so one of the new pieces that's, that's kind of interesting about the system and it's really helping us uh, process things uh, and, and get information between services a lot more efficient is uh, this new message queuing um, uh, system. And... Um, I'll, uh, I'm going to let uh, JB, the, the master of SQA, uh, or Joe again. I do that with Seth and Josh all the time. I'm going to let Joe talk about, uh, uh, talk about this. Okay. Okay. Um, the need for um, SQA actually uh, sprout, sprouted out when the uh, Last call up, and we uh, tried to introduce to you the, the concept of uh, replacing, totally replacing more or less with uh, uh, a new uh, application we call uh, a session state server. So the first uh, component that we had to uh, come up with is for this uh, particular application to be uh, HA capable, is to introduce a message queue or a network queue where components could um, send out events and other components would be able to receive them. Um, we evaluated a lot of, uh, I mean, the more popular um, um, message queue out there, um, we have RabbitMQ, JRMQ is uh, two of the most uh, popular um, alternatives or choices for um, a message queue. But, um, there are limitations to those uh, message queues because they impose the way you would use um, the message queue. They are basically applications that uh, receive events, and uh, you know they impose um, this is the way you should use uh, this queue. Now, um, during that time, we uh, we have we have we have heard of this new guy um, uh, called um, Zero MQ, which s uh, might still be considered as uh, uh, a queue um, in itself, but instead of it being an application, it is actually an API. So um, the, the the benefit of this um, um, new um, application or library or API is that you could actually model um, your queue uh, according to how you would actually need events to be uh, delivered uh, inside your um, uh, infrastructure. So um, we then decided that hey, this is the, definitely going to be the library for us. Uh, so the concept of SQA then was um, all right, we're going to use Zero MQ and um, test it whether it's uh, going to be um, fast enough for us. So we tested it, we gave it a lot of um, traffic, and lo and behold, it was really fast. It's a, it was uh, probably a uh, 30, 40 times faster than uh, the competition. So we, we did that, but uh, as soon as we uh, tried to use it for um, our, uh, uh, I mean, exchanging messages between uh, our components and HA, uh, HA capabilities and needs, uh, we saw that um, there's really um, some sort of a, you know, uh, limitation to it as well. So um, 
okay, uh, it's fast, we could use that, but we need to enhance it further. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a time when we came up with a concept of, okay, uh, let's come up with our own design of a queue, but still use zero and queue underneath it. So it's a, that's a time when uh, the concept of uh, the session uh, state agent or SQA uh, sprouted out. Okay, so basically, this is a this is a simple diagram that shows um, um, how the message queue is being used. It's pretty simple. Um, a process sends out an event, and uh, another process would either be watching those events, use it for uh, whatever you want to use it for, or uh, perform certain tasks based on receipt of those. So this this is the this is the publisher model for uh, the SQA. So basically, uh, we have two types, right? Publisher um, and the watcher. The publisher um, is basically a client. It connects to the message queue, and uh, it publishes data very very fast. And uh, whoever would need uh, to watch the data is free to subscribe to the message queue and tell the message queue, hey, whatever you you receive this particular data from. Uh, from any publisher who want to have a copy of it. So basically, basically this is like a, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a uh, loosely or a transparent way of just broadcasting data to whoever wants the data um, in, in, in the infrastructure. All right, the other one is uh, uh, the dealer worker design. Uh, this is where we actually decided that, hey, uh, we couldn't simply just just uh, be uh, contented about having to push a message and have somebody receive it. We need to be able to uh, push a message and um, be able to uh, load balance the work that needs to be done across the servers. And that um, uh, zero queue doesn't have the capability. So we, we, we enhance it a bit. And in this model, uh, you have a process pushing work or dealing work into the message queue, and the message queue is actually going to elect whoever um, um, worker it has registered to the message queue to handle that particular event. And uh, on top of that, um, this is something that is um, I'm guaranteed to work because uh, if a work has been pushed to a particular service and that service uh, did not respond or uh, 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 respond back to uh, the message queue that it did work, the message queue would then try the other service. So it's, it's, it's guaranteed to, uh, it, it, it needs to have a guarantee that, hey, you were able to handle that. And if you timed up, you did not respond back to me in this particular period, then I'm going to transfer back the work to the other service that's still up right now. Okay, um, going to real stuff in, in uh, the architecture. Um, Right now, um, in 4.6, uh, if, you, if you are particular, I mean, uh, if, you, uh, um, are, if you know about the, the really large um, initial notify for uh, open fire, when it, uh, you know, the price is subscribed to RLS and get all the statuses to zip messages, the cost you have in the system is really, is really heavy. So uh, what we did in uh, 4.6 is to uh, get rid of that, um, um, glue between um, open fire and RLS and replace so, it. Joe, with maybe they don't understand what that problem was. So, so in in four four, um, when we got uh, when we got above uh, you know about a thousand uh, people on the system, maybe nine hundred, maybe it was nine hundred and one. Uh, I don't know, but but open fire subscribed to the RLS service, and when when it would, when I, if RLS should restart or something, there would have to be a huge subscribe message. And that message would get to the point where the reply was too big and the packet would get chopped, okay? Which would end up screwing up that connection between open fire and the RLS, okay? 
Uh, so that's what he's talking about there. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So uh, we got rid of that in in, um, in four six by getting rid of that uh, subscribe from from open fire, and instead. Uh, open fire is actually just a watcher for events coming from RLS. So if your phone changes in state, you try to dial somebody else's number and RLS will be able to detect your, uh, your dialogue uh, state event. Automatically, uh, RLS would uh, send out uh, an event to the message queue and open fire would be able to see that event and be able to now determine the status of your, of your phone without that really large so there's really no change here. Uh, basically, just the manner of how data was transferred or relayed to Open Fire. Instead of using uh, subscribe and notify functionality, we're now using uh, the message queue. Okay, now there's a new component. I'm not so sure if you're, there's going to be a separate discussion about CIPEX Homer. If you're familiar with it already, you uh, tested it. It's basically uh, our new uh, reporting mechanism for uh, tracking down um, calls. Um, um, I mean the, the, the flow of calls and packets in, in, in TCP format or, or a PCAP format, or you want to see the details of your calls through a web page, you can check out um, the CIPEX Homer component. And again, the message queue uh, is responsible for uh, relaying um, copies of SIP messages uh, to CIPEX Homer for it to be saved into the database using the message queue. So this is still a publisher watcher um, 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 design. Um, you would now be able to tell that you know how lightweight um, SQA is because it's basically getting all uh, I mean a copy, a full copy of each message coming from all the SIP proxies. If you are in, on an HA uh, uh, setup, um, SQA will be receiving these messages from, from from the proxy, and it should be really lightweight and. That's the reason why we chose uh, zero Q. Zero Q is the one responsible for you know pushing this uh, data out. And then the last one um, right now uh, is uh, um, when uh, registrations. Uh, currently, what, what what's happening in in four four? Uh, what's happening is uh, RLS knows about uh, when phone boots up. First boots up is because first it registers, registers for register, and the the way we do it currently is using standard um, um, subscribe and notify. RLS would subscribe to uh, the register. Hey, I want to watch uh, the registration is of this particular uh, extension, and um, uh, the register would then send a notify to, to uh, RLS that uh, this phone is just registered, and that's how uh, RLS would. No, that the phone is registered and you then send out a subscribe to that phone so that it knows about the dialogue state of that phone. And that is really happening. So uh, we want to get rid of that again. So we scrap that out from uh, from RLS. It's, we still have this functionality in the register. You can still send a subscription there and watch uh, somebody else's or some, uh, some extension's registration. But now with the communication between RLS and the registrar, is uh, using the message queue. Now, this last component is using the dealer and uh, worker model. Why? Because um, in 4.6, we are intending, or SSS, uh, is intended to be HA. Right now, uh, RLS is not HA, but SSS would be. So there would be like uh, multiple um, copies or uh, instances of SSS. And it should be able to, uh, I mean, the network queue should be able to have the capability of choosing which particular um, instance would handle this registration so that it will be able now to watch that particular phone. So, again, um, uh, this is how the, the SQA uh, is assigned. Questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jory. Um, so, uh, Jordan was mentioning, uh, we call it triple S, or SSS, Session State Services. So, we talked about it a bit uh, last year. Uh, we're actually uh, still working on it, but it, it's going to be a highly available um, method of uh, 
the system knowing the state of all the calls, which is uh, something we don't really know because the system is a stateless proxy, hence not knowing the state. Uh, so we're building this, this session state services so we can better understand the state of devices and users on the system. And, and that's the part of the purpose here. Uh, RLS really for us is just uh, on the phone, off the phone. It's, it's really so stupid, right? It's just, is there a light going to be displayed because somebody's on the phone or not? And then the whole linking between open fire and RLS is simply being able to change somebody's status in open fire to on the phone or not. Okay, that's as complex as it is. Uh, but it's it because of the way it had to subscribe before to the RLS services, it was a huge pain and not very scalable beyond you know, beyond you know, a small number of users. Um, so now I'd like to uh, to have uh, Chipper talk about. Uh, you know, our, our testing procedures and, and what we're doing there. We've done a lot of work uh, around this and these guys have been uh, uh, working on the procedure and, and working on uh, the software to generate the load test of helping the system reliable. Hi everyone. Yeah, it's on. Hi everyone. Uh, okay, this is the first time I'm using this stuff. <laughs> okay. So uh, first uh, I want to tell you how procedure is uh, for us uh, at uh, EasyUs. So we're using, uh, well, right now most of the stuff is manual, uh, manual testing. Uh, so we're having small tests, so each build that, uh, let's say we predict that it might have a future, goes through a small test and we know that, well, if it passes everything, uh, then we know that it's not horribly broken. And then we can go on uh, with the uh, other stuff, like uh, sanity test, which is a longer test, which tests uh, all components uh, with some tests more or less complicated, depending on the feature. Uh, regression tests, which uh, test various uh, situations that we've seen in the future and uh, we don't want to, to, to repeat those problems. Um, and automated uh, load tests. These are something, uh, let's say, newer and uh, give us uh, some advantages. This way we can, uh, we can get more calls through that. Uh, some, some things that you cannot do with uh, you know, some people doing uh, testing. And uh, the last part of uh, our process is uh, to deploy it on our uh, production system that we use every day for talks between us or with the clients like Martin does. So this takes uh, a week for us and uh, only if uh, all these uh, tests pass we can say that okay this is something uh, that we can release uh, to our customers. We have confidence that it will work also for other people. Eating our own dog food. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, um, so the automated tests are uh, well. We're at the beginning of those. We want to extend them as much as possible. What? One of the most uh, tested things right now is the call part. I think everyone here uses CPEX for calling most of the time. I mean, IM presence and stuff are nice, but everyone wants to have the calls going through. So uh, this is uh, our goal right now. Um, okay. Uh, Basic testing that we are doing with manual cannot uh, predict uh, how the server behaves over time or how it behaves under stress like in a customer setup with many calls like a call center or uh, I don't know. Um, call load test helps us both problems and uh, also helps us uh, determine the performance of a certain server, you know, physical, virtual. Uh, some customers want to know exactly how many calls per second would it uh, would it would they be able to make on uh, 
but the hardware is for in a virtual environment and uh, also allows uh, you know the, for us and for other people to determine the scaling capability like okay this is our one server let's put another one and another one and see uh, how much better it works or how much worse it is <laughs> okay um, this is uh, the diagram of uh, how our automated system works well it's kind of complicated inside um, the basic uh, well um, pros for it is that uh, it's uh, installed from RPMs so for most people that uh, might want to use it in the future is something like you do install an RPM and then configure it as you do with another service in uh, CPEX. Um, it's uh, command line driven and it's interactive so you get to see the results real time like you get to, it's done in CP and it has a let's say nice interface and you get to see that uh, on how the calls are flowing and what problems are in there um, uh, you can edit those files so you can uh, modify it to suit your needs and also a another pro is that you can um, you can put a configuration from uh, that you want to have and then uh, we have it in the lab and then uh, the test uh, subsystem gets uh, that configuration onto the the machine that runs the test so you don't have to write it manually you just get it from the config uh, server right so a customer can take can take their running configuration from their cluster restore it to a system that's in the lab and this test system will pull that configuration information for users and whatnot uh, and, and build its configuration files from that from that live system, or not from the live system, but from the lab system. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So is that message available now? Do you, do you use the user screen code to get that on that message? Is it public yeah. or is it just something you guys can use? It's public. Yeah. And it's it's, uh, does that even run on a system where you have users installed, or do they run on a standalone? Um, so, so here's what I want. Here's one thing I want to do. I want to introduce some latency in the system. You know, can I do that with those two, or can I run the system? You know, run the test server here and the infrastructure here with some mobile latency. Yeah. And see how that works. So, so it runs on a cluster member. Yeah. And you can do a yum install, yeah. but that cluster member doesn't have to be doing anything else, right? It's, the cluster member can just have the CIPEX test you can, on. You can run it in any possible. Okay. Uh, yes, 
Sipping can do media also, so you can include that uh, here. Do we have that as part of the test system uh, yet? Yeah, yeah. The, the voicemail test is a composite of voicemail and someone's counting to 10. You can hear that. So it's sending audio to the voicemail. So you send me here. <coughs> now, SIPP doesn't understand media. So if you're trying to write a test that interacts with the IVR and waits for some response, you can't do that. But if you time your, your test right, you can emulate a deposit or retrieve it. Yeah, but when if I made a capture or a formula, I could see how the word PD packets were flowing. That's exactly right. So for the RTP, right, you, you, your SIPP test, you say here's my RTP, um, and then you capture it. Um, and here are some numbers of uh, our load tests. Okay, we generally do the load test, the call load test for three days. Uh, we do it at 15 calls per second. And this gets us to about 4 million calls running through the system. And after this, we just look at it and see, okay, memory leaks, uh, anything crashes, or we look at it anyway during this period of time. Um, actually, one uh, interesting thing is that uh, last week I upgraded our, uh, let's say, hardware in Amazon for this, and uh, I managed to run uh, 40 million calls in, I don't know, three, four days while I was on wait, the way here, and it uh, and it went really great. Great. This is it from me. Thanks for great. So, what do you guys think? Pretty cool. Can model a complete system um, and uh, and run tests against it. Pretty neat stuff. Yeah, I think you could you could uh, it, you know it, it would test against your SIP domain, right. Uh, right? Which you could just take that box and put it on the other side of your session boarding controller and test running through that. So uh, you know, this is something we definitely want to add to and, and expand on. Um, is uh, you have to use a screen command and, and do some different things to see these results. I, th I think we'd like to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, you know, over time. Um, How many people can spell SIP P? I think one of the things we're still missing in our tests is the ability to test the RLS uh, stuff. You know, we, we Douglas did some work around uh, the RLS. You know, we, we had this uh, question from a customer: How many RLS, you know, people can you support now that connection to open fire? We don't know yet because SIPP wasn't very good at exercising the, the RLS. Uh, yeah. So for RLS, it's presence. Here 
and we explained this, I don't know if you weren't in here, uh, but the way that it's going to work in 4.6 is that the RLS messages coming out of, of you know, the phones and going to RLS will be passed to this message queuing, okay? And those messages are then passed to open fire through that queuing mechanism, okay? Instead of using the standard RLS procedure, which was really what was killing it in 4.4. Four. You had that 10K uh, corruption bug that was in there? The what? That 10K message corruption bug that was in there? Yeah, that's, exactly yeah, that's that. That's this is what's getting rid of that. Okay. Okay. So we're getting rid of that big. It's that big subscribe that was the problem. Okay. And and this component here is getting rid of that. Or got rid of that. Of course, it's So, but the, st the need still exists to make RLS HA. Okay. And, and this is part of what Triple S is going to do for us. So, um, but, but other than BHA, you think it's, it's fixed and it works? We think so, but I can't tell you exactly how many. Okay? So, probably more than a thousand now, but we just, the, the test, the problem is finding something that can exercise the RLS properly. Uh, and we're, we've gone through, I don't know, three or four different. Um, stacks and you know trying to find one that, that can that we can um, that we can uh, script and extend right so we can have multiple threads um, most of them are designed to work with a, a single user uh, with a single piece of software user agent not necessarily be you know, scaled out to do you know 10,000 RLS you know pieces so well I mean, I mean just to get me a lot you know much be a lot of presence to work on a single phone you know, so it's a challenge before but that all that all works. Yeah. So yeah, BLF's right up there with MWI in my book. <laughs> it's a stupid light that everybody's gonna have. <laughs> um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, OpenUC and Simpex UCS uh, 4 6 status. Uh, so we've been running um, the system as our production system since July uh, 2012. Uh, we've been in uh, controlled release since about August 2012, uh, and we went GA December 1st, uh, 2013. Um, one of the things that we missed uh, getting into the GA piece was the Polycom stuff. That was, uh, it was one of those things that just we could not get out in time uh, and we wanted to get it out uh, two to three weeks after the uh, release uh, the GA but uh, it really dragged us out until beginning of February getting an update one out uh, and that was largely due to uh, the Polycom firmware. Um, the other thing we also added in uh, to update one uh, some, some really nice new uh, IP tables capabilities uh, as well as uh, you know some of the, any bug fixes that came in uh, along along the way, I'll be talking about the IP tables stuff um, tomorrow in the training. Uh, update two came out very rapidly after update one. <laughs> uh, it was a small code revert, uh, something that got stuck in that, that we need to, to to pull back out. Um, and uh, update three is today. Update three is ready. We just got the word this morning. Uh, so update three has uh, more bug fixes um, and uh, also implements fail to ban. Any questions uh, about this? No. Uh, I think things are, are getting to the point where uh, we're we're working out. You know, most of the minor little annoyances. I think we're kind of on to, you know, level two minor annoyances. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just got word uh, this morning. So I'm announcing it right now. Excuse me? 
Um, I don't uh, know all the customers. We have it in quite a few places running in, in the lab. Um, I know uh, probably four or five that I've uh, been directly involved with. I'm not sure how many in the open source community uh, are running in production. So I've got uh, two or three five node clusters uh, running. They've been running uh, since before GA. So, um,
Uh, so uh, the plan is to have uh, support for those uh, closely. Uh, another component that uh, we've, we've had veiled references to uh, so far is called SIPEX SBC. Um, the goal for this product is to get rid of the current media relay and get rid of SIPEX bridge. Um, SIPEX SBC will also um, terminate um, WebRTC connections for us. Okay, so this will be kind of our, our Swiss Army knife uh, border uh, product that will let people and devices from the outside connect into the system. Um, so the, uh, the NAT traversal piece and the media relay are, are, are from a component that Jogan built called uh, Karoo. Uh, part of that, anyway. Yeah. OSS Core. OSS Core, sorry. Uh, and then uh, we're going to build the trunking in uh, free switch uh, to terminate the trunks. And uh, we've already done a lot of testing around that. And, and Josh has uh, done a lot of work there. Uh, session state services, I think, is uh, you know on the farther end of that uh, Q2 uh, uh, piece. Um, uh, Jogan and uh, and Daniel here are working on uh, working on the uh, CIPEX SBC first, and then they'll be moving to the the S. Uh, the other piece we already talked about, getting rid of the uh, having to have an odd number of servers, uh, something Douglas is working on. Uh, hopefully that's, you know, mid-year, that'll be ready, if not sooner. Um, call queuing. So in, uh, in uh, 4.4, we had some really rudimentary uh, ACD capabilities and call queuing capabilities. Um, we realize people still need to do that. Uh, and some people don't necessarily want to go all the way to, you know, put in open ACD and and have to do that. So, um, currently being developed right now is this uh, component called call queuing, and this will do some uh, some basic call queuing for us. And uh, we're basically uh, taking uh, the mod mod call center from FreeSwitch and adding that uh, configuration piece into our into our GUI. Um, and then uh, Unite 2.0. I guess you guys all saw that after we got the networking stuff straightened out in there. Uh, Unite 2.0, um, uh, I think it's pretty close. Uh, I think uh, end of Q2 is, is what we're kind of targeting uh, to get something out. Uh, so it's kind of the near term stuff. Uh, longer term, uh, adding reporting into OpenACD. So the initial piece of OpenACD is only going to have um, supervisor portal and, and agent portal that all be in, in a web GUI. Um, and, uh, we still need to add reporting in because to ACD people, reporting is everything. Right? Nothing else barely matters. As long as you can queue a call, all they really care about is getting the reports. Um, so uh, we'll have all the statistics built and uh, we're, uh, we're moving forward there. Um, the other piece that Douglas is going to be working on is the uh, branch office solution. So we heard Audio Codes talk about. Uh, Audio Codes talked about their SaaS, the standalone survivability. Um, what we want to be able to do here is be able to have a small server that we can put on a customer site, be able to have a, a copy of voicemail that might need to exist for those users at that site, also any IVR, you know, any voice, any uh, auto attendance and whatnot. Um, so th this is the goal of the uh, Breach Office solution. Uh, and then also longer term, we really want to uh, get this user portal uh, rewritten. Uh, what we want to have is a zero install client that is totally web based. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and uh, you know, lower on the list uh, after the user portal uh, is uh, starting to work on the admin GUI. It needs a bit of a refresh. It's getting a little long in the tooth. It's very functional very efficient, uh, but we feel it, it needs some work. So. Okay, thank you.